Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Whitney Johnson. I'll tell you all about Whitney in just a moment. Um, Grace Under Pressure is that show that deals with what's too often dismissed as the soft stuff, but it's really hard to do. You know, the caring, the compassion, the commitment we exert toward others. And when you do it as a leader, as you will discover that Whitney is, uh, you do it for a good reason. Bring people together for common cause. Whitney Johnson, it is an honor to have you on the show. Welcome. Sean, thank you for having me. Great. Whitney is the CEO of a tech-enabled talent development company that is in the Inc. 5000. That is way cool and way hard to do, folks. Uh, recently, uh, Whitney was named the number eight and Thinkers 50 um, list of management thinkers, management and leadership thinkers, which is another big deal. Uh, she's been on that list, I think, forever. She lectures at Harvard Business School and Corporate Learning, and she contributes to Harvard Business Review, uh, has been doing so for decades, as well as MIT Sloan. Her newest book, and we're going to focus on that, is um, Smart Growth, How to Grow Your People to Grow Your Company. Grow your people, grow your company. Common sense, isn't that? Um, <laughs> makes sense. Welcome, Whitney. So, oh, John, thank you. I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Great. You suggest, before we jump right in, uh, 2020, people call it, it's a year of opportunity, not this moment, but uh, it will be, see a year of tremendous growth. Yet there is something the media likes to call the great resignation. You have another term for it. Mm -hmm. So why? So. Yeah, so um, psychologists have, have described that when people come through a period of severe stress, which of course the pandemic has been, that oftentimes um, what ensues is a period of tremendous growth and um, it's called post-traumatic growth. And so as I think about what's going on in the world right now and people are resigning from jobs, um, I think that there is some element of this where people, because of the pandemic, they had time to rest and to reflect, and there was this upheaval, and they saw life from a different perspective. They're not so much resigning from something. Sometimes they are, but more often it's this, I am aspiring to, I'm aspiring to something new, something more for my life. I, I want to grow in a way that I haven't grown before. And so I would, I think it's an important reframe of it. We're not resigning from, we're aspiring to. The great aspiration. I love it. <laughs> so that's wonderful. And I haven't had quite heard um, what we've been enduring as uh, PTSD, but indeed in many ways, it is certainly for so many people because they've been so isolated. So that's why your book is so necessary. You have something called the S curve of learning. What's yeah. that all about? Yeah. Whitney? Well, so many people are going to be familiar with the S-curve. Not everybody, but many will if, if you're in product management, et cetera. And this is something that was popularized by the sociologist Rogers back in 60, 70 years ago. And it, what it does is it, and I'm going to draw it for you, it basically traces how groups change over time. And, um, and as we looked at this S-curve, and I'll talk about it in a minute, and we were using it at the Disruptive Innovation Fund with, with Clayton Christensen, I had this aha that we could use the S curve to understand how individuals change, how we grow and how we develop. And so every time we start something new and we are starting something new, the post pandemic world, we are at the launch point of a new S curve. So there's this part of the S curve. And at the launch point, um, that's a place where um, growth is going to, it's happening, but because we haven't put all the pieces together where our brain is running this predictive model, hypothesis, lots of pr our predictions are incorrect, we're going to make lots of mistakes. So it's uncomfortable, it's awkward, we may feel impatient, it feels like a slog. So the launch point of your growth, it's going to be slow. But then you're going to continue to make those predictions in your brain and they'll be increasingly accurate and that will hit the knee of the curve and you'll move into the steep, sweet spot of that S, that sleek back. And this is a place where things are hard, but not too hard. They're easy, but not too easy. And your brain's getting increasingly good at running that model. And so now you're having lots of emotional upside surprises, lots and lots of dopamine that makes you exhilarated. It's fun to be in this place. So that's a place where growth not only um, is fast, it feels fast as well. So you've got slow and then fast. 
And then in mastery, what happens is you become very good at what you're doing. Uh, but because you're no longer enjoying the feel good effects of dopamine, because you figured everything out, you become bored. And so growth actually slows. So you've got slow, and then fast and slow is how you grow. And it's a very simple visual model, because it's simple, it's useful. And for everybody who's thinking about I want to grow, but I'm not sure how this model helps you have a map. That's great. And, and the wonderful thing, and you, I'm sure you've heard this many times, that there are many business models and all of them are wrong, but there's one that's right for our business. And the S-curve of what, it's not a, well, I, I guess you, one could call it a model, but one develops it as it's applicable to one's own business. Am I correct in that? Correct. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah so. Absolutely. So a dumb question from me, um, when we hit, I love being in that S curve, that's where everything's, uh, the dopamine is flowing and all that. Then when things slow, is that a time where we kick it in again or what else, what do we do, uh, Whitney? Yeah, so. it's a great question. So so if you you know that when you are at the top of that S curve, you you know that it's effectively a plateau that could become a precipice you're figuring things out, you don't have any dopamine. And so what you need when you are in mastery is you need a new challenge. Um, you've completed the growth cycle and so now it's time to start another growth cycle. Now, completing that growth cycle can come in a couple of different ways. One is you can just jump to a brand new S curve and do something completely new or, or build on what you've been doing. Or you can find a way where you say, you know, this is, this is a summit, but it's not the summit. So you're in a role and you've mastered everything that you needed to do in this role at this particular time, but you really like the role and you really like the company, how do you reconfigure it? How do you take on some new projects um, so that you push effectively push yourself back into the sweet spot? But, but to your initial question is when you reach mastery, um, you grow or you die. And so you have to make a choice what are you right. going to do here? Well, and this gets, to, I think, to your sweet spot, and I'll use the term perhaps others have. <laughs> you are the queen of self-disruption, are you not? <laughs> and that is the name of your podcast, not the queen, the Disrupt Yourself. And that was yeah. a, a, a earlier book I'll, of yours. I'll take, I'll take queen. Queen is good. <laughs> queen is okay. regal. Yeah. Empress? Uh, okay. That's, <laughs> all right. Oh, I like Empress. That's queen of disru uh, Disruption. Yeah. So, but why? Okay, so we're cool, and and I see something, but and then we you have to talk about you talk about the S curve and things change, but then you said you have to be smart about growth. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't every business person say, "Well, hey, uh, Whitney, I am smart about growth." So, yeah. if one says that, what is he or she missing? Yeah, so. right. And, and how, how am I using this term of art? And so, so the way I am using it is, um, we all have. Many of us have smart devices, right? We've got smart watches, we've got smart refrigerators, we've got smart cars, et cetera. I, I just need a smart brain, that's yeah, all. <laughs> smart brain, yeah. And I, I happen to have a whoop. And, and one of the things that happens is that when we get information about where we are, how much sleep we're getting, how well we're recovering, what our heart rate is, that information precedes that ability to, to make progress. It, it precedes, um, it, it gives us data that we need to improve. And so what I am arguing is that when you know where you are in your growth, when you know if you're at the launch point, um, when you know if you're at the sweet spot or in mastery, that's giving you information about what you need to do next and what you need. If you're thinking about this from a mountain. This is a mountain, not a wave. You're saying, okay, well, if I'm at the launch point, well, I know that I need support. And if I'm in the sweet spot, what I know is I need focus. And if I'm in mastery, what I know I need is a challenge. And so when you are smart about your growth, when you know where you are in your growth, you increase your capacity to grow. You know what I like about this model? And um, I love, I've always loved the term when it comes to learning about mastery. Um, and one thinks of it as kind of a, the pinnacle. I've achieved it. I am a pro full professor, if we will. Okay. But what you've done there is kind of injected a sense of humility to it. So it ain't over yet. You have to keep going. Is, is that some of the thinking that pushes you forward, Whitney? So. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, I think about, it's very much a fractal, right? Because I think of our life as an S-curve, and I talk a little bit about this in the epilogue, and, and, and our life is a series of S-curves. And so 
what we're, I believe that we're fundamentally wired to make progress. The very first line of the book is growth is our default setting. And so the question is, is how do we go on one curve to the next curve to the next curve so that we're continually making progress in all parts of our life? Great. Now, um, we're getting into success and getting into a little bit of the psychology and too much, which is always dangerous for somebody like me, doesn't have a clinical background. But um, when we're when we decide we want to choose to change and things, what holds us back? So what sabotages our success? So. Mm. Yeah. So one of the things that sabotages our success is that. Um, is that when you're at the launch point of that S, well, actually, let me back up because there's a prior to that. So when you're in mastery on an S curve um, and you may not like it, you may not like your life at all, but it's <laughs> very comfortable because you've got the super highway of habits going, right? So you're here you are on this curve, you're at the top of the mountain, you're not really liking it, but it's very comfortable and it's the status quo. Yeah. And so effectively, when you're thinking about doing something new, you've got the super highway of habits, these neural pathways that are very, very thick at the top of this S curve. And thinking about doing something new is going from being able to drive 100 miles an hour on that super highway to figuring out how to navigate your way along a cow path. That's not easy. No. That's unknown. That's uncomfortable. You don't have the neural pathways built. So that's the first thing is that sense of it's unknown. I don't know what it's going to look like. And oh, by the way, when I do something new, I'm, there's going to be a loss of identity because I won't know who I am. I'm going to be someone different. So that's something that start, stops you from starting. One of the things that I do advocate for at that point is to um, utilize the loss aversion theory where um, they talk about Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman that we're more motivated by what we lose than by what we gain. So you flip it on yourself instead of being at the top of the curve and thinking about here are all the exciting things that are going to happen if I do something new. You say to yourself, what bad things are going to happen to me if I stay here? Yeah. And that That's great. You uh, to start never with argue with yeah. Never argue with Danny Kahneman. Uh, so. No, exactly. <laughs> well said. Yeah, no, but I like that. And you know what? It gets to it is uh, it's a sense of uh, you need courage to do this, and it's mm -hmm. not easy. And I'm glad you you address that head on. So yeah, yeah. You call so there's something that if we're going to embark on this measure and you write about it, it's the something you call the personal audit. What does that involve? Um, yeah, I don't think it involves your accountant, but just yourself, correct? <laughs> so. Yeah. So one of the things that's going to happen is when you you move to a new S curve and you've explored it and said, you know, I think I I think I want to be here. It's it's something I. I believe I can do, I feel like it's worth doing, I feel like it's in line with my values, et cetera. You need to start collecting data, um, data that will indicate you know, feedback of am I gaining, making progress, but also feedback or data around, um, uh, do, can I get the resources that I need to do that? And some of those resources are internal, is do I have the ability to do this? And so when I talk about the audit, this, some of this is based on the work of Tara Swart, who's a neuroscientist, is, is to ask yourself, well, what roles did I play in my family growing up? Um, and am I continuing to play that role right now? And is that role that I play, whether it's the person who is the, um, the rapscallion or the person who's <laughs> taking care of everybody, is that role that I play, do I continue to play that role? And will that role serve me in trying to climb this S curve? So that's one thing that you want to think about. Another thing you want to think about is what are some of your mental models that are going to help or hinder you? So one, for example, for me is um, I find that I say a lot of the time I have to do this. So I could be going on a wonderful vacation. I could be getting ready to go give a speech you know, in a wonderful part of the world where I'm going to get to talk to people about these ideas that I care deeply about. And I'll say, I have to go do this. And one day, my one of my children called me out and said, why do you always say you have to? And I realized that when you say I have to, and this is something that I learned as a child, right, this adult audit, is there's this sense of this sense of obligation, this lack of autonomy, this lack of agency. And if I am lacking autonomy and lacking agency, 
that means that I'm a victim at some level. And I don't believe that I can move up this curve because things are going to prevent me from doing so. So that's what I mean by an audit is, can you get the resources, the expertise from other people, the partners you need, but also what's going on in here that's going to help you move up that curve or hinder you? I like how you use the have to. Uh, I know I have, that's a a dictum, I think, that has uh, bedeviled me uh, at times. It's enabled me to do uh, some good things, but I think in some ways it carries baggage to it. So I like that. And I have to say, um, um, Whitney, and I've done, you're the 140th guest on here, and no one has used the word rapscallion. So kudos <laughs> to you. <laughs> I love Thank that. you. I get the new word for the day. New word. Along with being the queen, you're also uh, introduced rapscallion. That's good. So now getting back to your business, I think, um, what implications does the S-curve have for talent development? So, mm. Yeah, so... So when you understand what growth looks like, so you now got this simple visual model to demystify your own growth, whether you're starting a new project or hobby or job, you now have this model, this language really, that you can use to have a conversation with the people that you work with, with your reports or people that you you report to. And you're able to have this conversation of, Okay, so we've got this assessment tool that you can take it as a 10 minute assessment that allows you to see where people are. But even at more simply than that, you can say to a person, so where do you think you are in your growth? Do you think you're at the launch point, the sweet spot and mastery? Because what you're going to need from me is different depending on where you are. And then I can tell you where I think you are. And we can have this conversation about how you're going to get to the top of the curve. What's important about the way we've crafted this is it's not about where I as a manager think this person is. I think you're in the sweet spot. You're doing a great job. What matters is where do they think they are? Because if I have someone working for me who says, I feel like I'm in mastery, that's going to predict their behavior, not where I think they are. So if they feel like they're in mastery, they're going to get complacent or they're going to leave. So when I can have this conversation We can figure that out sooner so that I can retain them, so that I can develop them, so that I can also plan, do the succession planning that I need to do. And so I think, is there a link then between one's mastery and an employer's uh, would view that as a flight risk? Is there a connection there? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So one of the things that we'll, we'll see in our assessment and when we look at the data is that if you have people who are showing up in mastery and also are checking that I'm bored and not motivated, (laughs) that's a really good sign that they are, you've got some flight risks. And so what you want to do is have these conversations so that when they're in the sweet spot and they're not yet a flight risk, you're figuring out, okay, so what's our plan when you get into mastery? And oh, by the way, if you have a whole cohort of people who are all in the sweet spot right now, if they all graduate to mastery at the same time, now you've got a challenge as well. You've got a huge succession issue. So you want to look at not only where individuals are, but where are, where is your team and your organ, your workforce overall, because then you can plan. But on the other side, looking at from the, um, the employee's standpoint, and I know we always basically essentially what you said about the era of great aspiration is that if I'm in my mastery, but I'm not being fulfilled, is it maybe the best thing I should do is look elsewhere? So, yeah, I mean, so, so what I would say is it depends on, uh, we, sometimes see that once you have this language to have this conversation with your manager, it may be that there is not another curve for you. It may be that this is the summit, but because you've now spoken this common language, the manager realizes, Oh, it's not me. It's not even the company. It's just that they're not getting any more dopamine. They need a challenge and we can't provide that for them here. But then it also allows you to have people and say, all right, well, maybe there's something blocking them. There's a a traffic jam where we need to re-scope their roles and responsibilities so they feel like they have more headroom on the curve. Or maybe they can stay in this role, but we need to give them some new projects so that their portfolio overall, so they're in the mastery here, but they've got these two projects where they're at the launch point so that in aggregate, 
their portfolio of curves puts them in the sweet spot of the S. That's good. And it gets down to an amazing concept. Have a conversation with them. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard that before, Whitney, but, uh, but it, it also raises something else. There's anecdotal evidence. I have not seen anything that people who have jumped right away because they could get to the other side and they go, hmm, maybe the green, the grass is not greener on the other side. So such a conversation has merit. Would you not agree? So, Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think that's one of the challenges right now is that sometimes people there there's a there's a subset um, where people may decide to resign just because they're they're burned out. But I think if you can say to yourself, you know, I really do like my boss. I really do like this company. Can we reconfigure this? Um, it's always there's always so many unknowns when you decide to make a move. You really want to to find a way to stay within this ecosystem if you like it. Find a new lily pad within the ecosystem that you're in rather than going to an entirely new pod. Great. Now, we're in the, the world, I wish we were, but it's, we're still lingering, the post-pandemic world. Do mm -hmm. um, you have some thoughts on engagement, whether it's I, we're working virtually, whether we're working hybrid? I tend to think we'll end up with a hybrid model. I defer to you. But um, are there some things that managers need to be thinking hard about when it comes to engagement? So Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. So, so I think much of what we've already talked about is this idea of, of having a conversation, understanding where people are in their growth and, and, and understanding, do they perceive that there's growth upside and are you offering that? In terms of some more basic engagement suggestions, what I would look to is that when we've got this hybrid model, when we're having these conversations like you and I are having, and we've got 10 people, 15 people in, in on the call, is to really look at the work of Atul Gawande, who wrote the Checklist Manifesto, and he talked about activating people. And what he found is that when you put people into an operating room, at the beginning of that surgery, if everybody said their name at the beginning, the, the surgeon to the orderlies, the complications and deaths from surgery went down by 35%, simply because people said their name they were then willing to speak up when they saw an issue. So did I lose you? No, <laughs> oh, um, no that is such a simple thing to do. Yeah. And it's such a good reminder. And yeah. it's always comes down to that human touch mm -hmm. um, and how we, you know, connect with one another. It comes down to just basic recognition. So I, I love yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. And so, um, okay. Also in this, pandemic or post pandemic will get there eventually. So what about energy? How do leaders energize in our, so I use the term upside down world. So mm. how do you energize? I think that um, such a great question. So let me think about, cause I haven't really been asked this question. It's a little bit outside of how I'm thinking about, but I, I, I do think well, that to work makes work for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think it, but it's good. Cause then I get to, we get to riff and create something at the yeah. same time. So what gives us energy? I think we get energy when we feel like there's opportunity, when we feel like we can grow. I mean, when we feel like, you know, if, if I go into a situation, I think I'm going to learn something here. Number one, number two, I feel like, you know, we talk about in the book, the ecosystem chapter, do I feel like I'm going to grow? Do I feel like um, the people that I'm working with, I feel connected to these people? Do I feel connected to the mission of what we're doing? Do I feel like I have the resources that I need to do the work and including the, res the resource of being able to rest and take a break? Because that's a resource, the ability to rest. Um, if all of those pieces are in place, then this ecosystem that I'm in is giving me um, what I need so that I can give out more than I'm getting. So, so those are all those different pieces of this sense of connection and, and, um, and growth. You said two key things. And so often when we talk about energy and I and you are um, and I will just say this an off the chart, bright and incisive thinker. And, and that's why people follow you. First thing you said is if I'm going to learn something new. And that gets back to that concept that you had of mastery of 
Uh, it's not a, a finishing line. It's not the finishing line. It's going to continue. And the other thing, thank you for mentioning the idea of rest and downtime, because mm -hmm. how many times do we work with senior leaders who are out, out, outward directed, which is good. That's how they got there, but they deplete themselves. Am I correct? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and it's fascinating. So we were just looking at the numbers for, um, so I have a podcast called the disrupt yourself podcast. And we were looking at our numbers for last year and we've got some, we've had some really big names on the podcast. People Huge that are, names. <laughs> people, that are, people that are well known. Um, and yet the podcast. Uh, let's name them. Uh, Stanley McChrystal, Brene Brown, uh, yeah. Seth Godin, or, you know. Uh, well, we did not, we did not have Seth Godin yet. Okay. But someday, Sorry. Yeah. Um, but we had, we had, um, we had John Tesh, we had micro. So people, names that, that people know. One of the people that, not as many know is a woman by the name of Jennifer Moss, who wrote a book called The Burnout Epidemic. One of my most listened to episodes last year is hers. Why? Because what's happening is they're listening to it and then they're sharing it. And so people are saying, I don't quite know how to do this rest thing. Help me figure this out. That's what they're really saying. Uh, that, what a wonderful! I'm glad you talked about that. I, we've talked about on this show uh, the many, many episodes of about personal resilience and it's burnout, and you can't push yourself any further. That you know the the spirit may be willing, but the flesh cannot do it. And mm -hmm. after a while, you're so tired that what takes you 15 minutes takes you three hours, and you become effectively drunk. Not you don't get a buzz, right. you just right. drag. And, right, right, right. And it's you're not good to be you're not good. And I think a thing that perhaps you tell that it don't rest for yourself, rest for others. Do you yeah. have you thought about that? I mean, so Oh yeah. I mean I think I think that, that that's absolutely true. It's funny when you start started to talk about resting, I found myself yawning. So that's a good sign. Um, <laughs> no, it's just me. Yeah. It's it's me, Whitney. It's not you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um so I think I think it depends. I, I it depends on you. I mean, some people are able to rest for themselves and they need to help others rest. And other people are terrible at resting for themselves and able to help others rest. So I think it just depends on who you are. The, the reality is, is that you need to know how to do both. It's just the same as what we talk about in this book is you need to grow and you need to help other people grow. Both okay. matter. Both okay. are essential. And one size doesn't fit all. And that's why I think your S curve is so valuable because if I understand it correctly, we design it for ourselves. And so mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. Now we're coming to the end of the show and I'd like to ask every guest a story about grace. And do you have one you wish to share with us, Whitney? So. Story about grace. Or an example of grace. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, First of all, I just love that word so much. I think it's so beautiful. Um, one of the things I think about, uh, we, so I'm, I'm, I'm a person of faith and, and there's a, a passage of scripture that talks about Jesus as, as growing from grace to grace. Mm. And I, I love that idea of, um, and we think about a, a person being gracious or graceful. And over the past couple of years, I think we've thought a lot about giving people grace. And so I think I love that concept because it, it, it reminds me to give myself grace and give other people grace. And it's this place of just a willingness to believe that people are doing the best that they can. Um, and so to me, it's just a beautiful, beautiful word for, for, for many, many reasons. So those are my, my reflections. You, know, you touched on so many of the attributes that I have thought about, respect for others, generosity, grace. But you said something, and I'm glad you did this because it doesn't get spoken about enough. Show myself grace. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we can be too hard on ourselves. So yes. Um, yes. great. Um, Whitney, how can people find you and how can we get your brand newest book? So, yeah. Well, um, so I would say the, the way that you can get the book right now, the ease, absolute easiest way is to go onto Amazon. And um, that's the, the easiest way is to click onto Amazon and buy a copy of the book, um, Smart Growth, How to Grow Your People to Grow Your Company. If you're looking to be able to engage, um, I do do a LinkedIn Live every Thursday at 9 a.m. And then I have a podcast, of, as we've discussed and then you can email me, wj at whitneyjohnson.com. I do respond to every email. Sometimes I'm very slow, but I do respond. <laughs> because people, But people give me grace. 
Right. Whitney, you are very generous to us and to me in particular, and I say thank you. And with that, we will close out. Mm.